excited for tonight's AO Trauma North America Journal Club on clavicle fractures. Uh, we're going to introduce our panel, but uh, just a, a couple things for tonight. You'll see some slides in a couple of minutes just going over the ground rules, but uh, I'll repeat it a couple of times as we go through. But please use the Q&A function to get your questions answered uh, throughout the day or throughout the, uh, the session. So I'm really uh, happy to introduce the moderators. I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves really briefly before we uh, move on. But this is our, our moderator session, and then I'll show you the our speakers as well. So uh, if you want to start. Sure, I'll uh, start. I'm Carolyn Tuga. I'm uh, out of Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. I'm Mary Erdman. I'm with Dr. Strelzo at University of Chicago. Hi, everyone. Augustine Saez. I'm at UC Davis in Sacramento, California. All right. Um, and then our guest lecturers today are the people you will hear from. You'll uh, see them introduce themselves during the their presentations as well. But we're really excited to have really um, great thought leaders and, and some fantastic speakers presenting some really innovative stuff around clavicle fractures. And please uh, use the Q&A. Like I said, ask the questions. This is your opportunity to sort of pick pick the brains of the people that are studying these problems and, and trying to get us some answers. Uh, the disclosure slide, uh, none are uh, appear relevant to uh, the content of the talk. You, uh, you've signed up for this, so you know what this is about, but really we're gonna go in depth with each of the articles, really understanding uh, why these articles are, um, are the way they are, why they were written, why the people who wrote them thought they were good questions to ask. Uh, and this is your opportunity to to really try and understand the thinking behind the paper and maybe some of the nuances of the paper. So um, again, just just like we we stated. So today we're really going to focus on biomechanics of fixation techniques. We're going to talk about adolescent clavicle fracture. That's a really hot topic right now and something that's uh, quite interesting. And I think the paper that uh, we're going to talk today about is a fantastic one to to help us understand these. And then last but not least, talk about non-unions and long-term functional outcomes. So this is sort of the overview. And uh, without further ado, we'll get into our first our first paper. And so this is our interview with Dr. Benton Hayworth, who is an orthopedic surgeon at Boston Children's. He's also the lead author on this paper titled Two-Year Functional Outcomes of Operative versus Non-Operative Treatment of Completely Displaced Mid-Shaft Clavicle Fractures in Adolescence. And this was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2022. So welcome and thank you for uh, participating tonight, Dr. Hayworth. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've come to recognize this as one of the more controversial areas in uh, orthopedics and sports medicine uh, and orthopedic trauma. Um, so when I was in training, um, the famous COTS study came out in 2007, and I really felt like very few studies have changed the field as uh, quickly and impactfully as that one did. And people really changed practice. Uh, and so we saw that and studies have demonstrated that for the world of adult clavicle fracture treatment, um, that was a real game-changing study. So um, people really didn't know what to be doing for the adolescents as we reviewed those cases in trauma rounds. And so, I thought it was one of the more fascinating dilemmas uh, in our field. And, um, and so our goal was to really better understand whether some of the findings that were emerging from the adult literature were applicable to these older adolescents or adolescents in general, um, with studies starting to emerge from pediatric centers that clavicle fracture fixation was happening. But those small retrospective studies didn't really give us a sense of whether it was effective uh, on a comparative standpoint, rather it was seemingly safe and um, and effective, but they, there weren't level two or even level three comparisons to, to between non-operative and operative. So that was our goal is just to better understand the topic. One of the goals uh, in assembling a, a study group devoted just to this one topic or just to this one sort of condition or, or injury was to find people who, who were enthusiastic about surgery, not just pediatric orthopedic surgeons who had followed their mentors down a path of universal non-operative treatment. I wanted to make sure that we had a cohorts that were large enough and balanced enough between the two, the two sides of the coin uh, that we could compare not just people that 
had a, a bias towards non-operative treatment. That's a misunderstanding a little bit about the facts group that uh, we, we thought the better treatment was non-operative. It really, we weren't sure, so. Yeah, um, so we wanted um, to look at, um, you know, uh, fracture healing um, and details about uh, surgery and the surgical intervention when it was performed, um, track complications, and I think our primary outcome was shoulder-specific validated um, functional outcome measures, PROs, patient-reported outcomes, uh, as um, that was one element that people wondered about over time. The, the dilemma for those of us that treat a lot of adolescents is often, do they do they do better with certain interventions because they uh, compared to adults because they're such good healers and they have young biology, or might they do worse because they're so much more active and they put mm -hmm. uh, their surgeries or their limbs to the test more than their adult counterparts? So that was a, a little bit of the question for this as well. Um, I was a bit surprised to find that there were more complications, um, and most of those um, were um, the need for secondary surgery uh, for uh, um, symptomatic hardware, and some might argue that's not a complication per se, that's just part of the natural history of, of uh, uh, RAF uh, surgery in general for fractures, mm -hmm. um, but when you compare it to somebody who heals uneventfully and does not need that extra chapter in their life and that extra anesthesia. I mean, we had um, we had some complications that were sort of a, a, you know, a problem for people that did affect their, their quality of life, uh, at, at least for periods of time. So, so the complications were more in the operative group, the secondary surgeries, most of them for removal of hardware were more, but otherwise um, there was no statistically significantly dif significant difference in the PROs and, um, the the PRO time point was two years, so we really wanted to see um, when um, when the dust had settled over time, how people felt about their shoulder. And did you guys look at the um, type of fixation used, for instance, you know, like a mini frag versus a small frag in the younger, smaller patient? We did, um, and that's not reported in the details of this study, just due to word limits. But there, there weren't that many users uh, at the time that most of the surgeries for this cohort um, uh, were being done that were utilizing the the mini frag techniques that in subsequent years have shown um, lower rates of removal. So most of these are are three five, and most of them are the manufacturer pre contoured clavicle specific plates. Uh, but there certainly were some old school recon plates and, and other techniques used. So, right. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think the facts group will ultimately, you know, put out between 10 and 20 uh, studies on the subject just because one of the weaknesses of our first go round, we call this sort of facts A, and we've developed a facts B um, cohort. So we, we halted enrollment uh, after the collection of this, um, you know, group of 900 clavicles and then started afresh with renewed focus on shorter term, earlier follow up, mm -hmm. just because when we did our interim analysis, we found we had lost so many to follow up in the early stages in terms of getting a sense of their, uh, their outcomes at the three, six and 12 month marks. Um, that we really focused on the 24 month follow up and that was impactful. But a lot of people say, well, I don't fix clavicles for people to feel good in two years. I fix them for them to feel good in four months. And so um, our next round of studies will have more of a curve over time following the natural history. Um, but also we're looking at those two combined cohorts because the first group was 900 fractures of all types and the second group fax b was just the completely displaced fractures we didn't sort of waste our time with fractures that probably weren't going to get surgery anyways right. um, or weren't real candidates for surgery so so we've combined those completely displaced cohorts and are looking at a variety of substratified analyses um, of, of subpopulations uh, within that just looking at older adolescents um, who either have accommodated fractures or who have severely shortened fractures, so 25 millimeters or more. So really, you know, starting to pare down or filter our larger database, um, where some people said, you know, kind of the, the less severe versions of the fracture or 
um, patients who were going to do well anyways kind of washed out the key findings. Now we're trying to look at who are the subset that really do need surgery. Because again, we almost have a surgical bias in our group. You mm-hmm. know, we we love this this surgery. It's a really effective surgery. And um, in addition to those older adolescents who were athletes who had severe fractures, either comminuted or severely shortened. We've also looked at the Z-type fractures, where mm-hmm. there's a you know um, a segment uh, in a three-part or a four-part that has vertical orientation of you know 45 degrees or or higher. So really, the ones that look pretty gruesome there on the X-ray and sometimes have the the prominence you know in terms of appearance. Um, we're also looking at um, just baseball players and comparing them to other uh, overhead athletes with a focus on the fractures in their dominant arm. Maybe those are the athletes that need to restore their biomechanics, you know, better. Because if we take a step back and say, well, why do we fix them in adults? And I think there's still controversy in the adult population. Certainly when you look at the randomized control trials from the other countries with similar population studied to the famous COT study, other authors, Robinson, Vertinen, have come to slightly different conclusions than the Canadian group did, which right. is really only the people with the two problems with non-operative treatment that stem from non-operative treatment, non-unions and symptomatic malunions are the ones that should get surgery. And it's less than 25% of the overall cohort. So why are we doing 100% surgeries when 75% of those people will actually do well? Well, those rates just don't approach adult rates at all in the adolescence. Right. So non-unions, not a never event. So non-unions are going to happen, but it's less than 1% in our variety of studies in the adolescent population. So better healing, thicker periosteum, uh, more ability to bridge those fractures. And then symptomatic unions is really our next focus. That's why we're looking at all these subpopulations and looking at their function at different time points to really understand how common is that phenomenon. And we didn't see it in more than two to 3%. And so if a non-surgical approach is effective, 97, 98% of the time, um, should we really be doing 100% of, of the fracture? What about the, the young adults? If most of the big adult studies have a mean age of 33 or 35, what should I do with my 20 to 25 year olds? And I think that might be the best study in clavicle fracture you know, uh, research in the future uh, is I think um, our body of work will ultimately show that while surgery is a re- reasonable option, it doesn't improve um, your, your risks and it doesn't improve your function Um, but, um, and hopefully, you know, operative treatment as a sort of primary treatment for adolescents, um, you know, is certainly the pendulum swings the other way. But the the question is those, those younger adults who have some of the healing capacity of the adolescents, um, and even still remodeling capacity. We know remodeling goes on up to age 25. Uh, this is the last bone of the body to finish ossification. And so a, a recent study that we did looked at the older adolescents into their 20s even showing uh, remodeling capacity. So what about the 20 to 25 year olds, um, some of whom are not involved in competitive sports anymore. And so they don't have the parents, you know, looking over your shoulder at the x-ray, wondering how quickly you can get their kid back to, uh, you know, their their dreams or their scholarship or their recruitment or what have you. Um, mm-hmm. But what should we do for that subset? So that, that'll be a good study as we collaborate with our adult partners. So far, based on our studies, and I don't want to sort of tip my cards, but those various substratified analyses so far, we have not found one that's had superior results um, with RAF compared to uh, simple sling treatment, most of the time, you know, uh, non-operative treatment. Um, I therefore am trying to talk most families and patients out of the surgical option. but I do think that surgery is still effective and maybe uh, what some people would choose. So it's very hard to refuse somebody a treatment that's effective when you share, you know, you go down this shared decision-making path. And, and the data that I share is, is pretty severe. And my recommendation is just about always for non-operative treatment. Um, the other subgroup that actually uh, I'll have more um, leeway to consider surgery is refractures. So mm-hmm. if a kid's um, suffered a refracture, which our rate in both groups is about 3%, 
Um, so that's one of the things people often ask, which is if the if it's bayoneted, will it break again in the future? The one subset that adult studies and work that we've done has shown actually has a higher risk of refracture is the angulated. So mm. not the completely displaced that bayonet, but rather the ones that you know are left with the sort of apex superior kind of lucency. Even months later, there's still that weak point and it's a bending force usually. So so those will refracture, but a refracture, regardless of the pattern. Um, we did show that has a slightly higher rate of non-union. So when we looked in a retrospective study, what were the risk factors for non-union? And this is 25 cases over 11 years at 10 different centers. So it's not a lot of cases, um, but uh, m many of them were uh, refractures. Well, thank you very much for um, sharing your insights on this paper and then your knowledge as well on the topic. And then we'll open it up to questions from the participants um, later in the journal club. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. We're in the Journal Club, uh, Mid-Shaft Clavicle Fractures, and I have with me uh, Dr. Prism Schneider. Thank you for joining. Great. Thanks so much for having me. All right. And you are an orthopedic traumatologist up in Canada, and uh, we're going to talk about her study, biomechanical study, looking at dual plating mid-shaft clavicle fractures. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. I think it's popping up. Here we go. Yes. So talking about biomechanical evaluation of different plate configurations for mid shaft clavicle fracture fixation, biomechanical study uh, performed at University of Calgary. Uh, and then Dr. Schneider, why don't you tell us kind of the impetus for doing this study um, and how that kind of idea came about? Sure. Thanks. So thank you again very much for the invitation to speak about our work. Um, I think the motivation really stemmed from the fact that we were seeing so much uh, increased clavicle fracture fixation. This really was born out of a series of very well done randomized control trials that really supported earlier functional recovery with surgical fixation. But unfortunately, with that also came the increase in secondary surgeries, mostly for implant prominence and the requirement for removal. So we began with a systematic review, and we actually looked at this in the literature, comparing single plate constructs versus dual plating with mini fragment constructs. And we did find that there was nearly a fourfold increased risk for implant removal with single plate constructs. So that really led us to believe that there was room for study in this area. The concern with the mini fragment plating was, is it strong enough to withstand the loads of physiologic function? Um, and there was some concern biomechanically that it wasn't nearly as robust. So that led us to design the study. Excellent. And in your practice, had you been doing single plating or dual mini fragment at this point? Yeah, that's a great question. So we were seeing an increased uptake in dual uh, mini plate fixation. That was certainly something in my practice that I was noticing anecdotally was very effective, uh, but also had a reduced implant removal rate clinically. Um, so we really set out to try to understand uh, the biomechanics and then hopefully inform clinical practice at this point. Awesome. So, so one of the reasons I uh, selected this study was I thought, you know, biomechanical studies, we see them a lot in orthopedics, but there's a lot of different set up and things to consider. And I thought this one was very well done. Why don't you kind of tell us what went into setting up the model here? And I just pick, take some shots from your paper that was published, looking at, you know, the cadav cadaveric clavicle here with different plate configurations and the setup you use for testing it. Why don't you kind of tell us about the design process? Sure. Thanks very much. So we actually began with a lot of pilot testing using synthetic bones, and that allowed us to actually design the custom jig that you see in the middle picture. Um, the clavicle is such a unique shape, so we needed to make sure that we were actually loading it appropriately and that we weren't getting any off axis loading um, based on differences in clavicle length or size. Um, so that was really the first step. And then we decided on these six different uh, treatment groups so that we had sort of two standard of care fixation strategies, which was the 3.5 superiorly plated uh, option and then also the 3.5 anterior single plate option. And then the other four uh, intervention groups were really based on what we were seeing clinically um, being used uh, throughout kind of practice evolving around us uh, throughout North America. Um, and as you can see here, this construct actually allowed us to use the potting with the PMMA to load the clavicle in different, um, different ways. And so we were actually able to perform axial loading 
probably clinically meaningful for a fall on your shoulder. Um, torsion also could be interesting with rotational injuries. And then we did cantilever bending as well, both in the anterior and the superior planes. So uh, that really allowed us to look at sort of all forces that this uh, unusually shaped bone sees. Um, we did begin with the non-destructive cyclic loading, where we took the maximal uh, force that, uh, that was achieved right before uh, the tenth cycle, and then we did do failure uh, destructive testing as well. And so you kind of touched on, but why did you choose to do cadavers instead of synthetic bone for this? Yeah, so excellent question. I think particularly in the clavicle with the unusual shape. We even saw different modes of failure in the synthetic bone where it was actually fracturing at the uh, junk a junction between the PMMA and the potting. And that really, I think, led us to believe that the synthetic construct for this particular fracture was not clinically meaningful. And so that's why we proceeded with uh, cadaveric bone specimens. Nice. And then uh, one more question about the model, the uh, fracture pattern you decided to choose here, uh, the thought process that went into that. Yeah, absolutely. So there were a couple of smaller biomechanical studies in the clavicle that have been done previously. I think some of the limitations were using a transverse fracture model with a small fracture gap. So what we actually did here was a butterfly fragment. It was inferior, so very commonly seen clinically. And we did fix it uh, very similarly to how you would uh, clinically. So we had lag fixation through our superior plate uh, whenever possible. And for the single plate anterior construct, that was the only time we had a separate inter fragmentary screw. So we really tried to replicate what we would do clinically. Excellent. And so looking at the results, we don't go into everything super granularly, but kind of what would you have the reader take away from all this data that you were able to present with all these different types of, uh, you know, testing, which is great. Perfect. Yeah, so there is a lot of data. So if I had to sort of highlight the main outcomes here, we really set this up to be a non-inferior trial. So we wanted to be sure that our dual constructs were not inferior biomechanically to the uh, kind of standard of care superior and anterior plating. And then we wanted to compare between groups to see if there was any dual plating construct that maybe was biomechanically optimal. And so the main take home was actually by placing a 2.4 millimeter plate superiorly, and that could either be an adaptation plate or an LCP, and then any 2.7 plate anteriorly, again, either adaptation or LCP, that combination was actually the stiffest in axial load. Um, even more so than anterior plating and uh, superior plating. And if you think about a fall on your shoulder, that's probably the axial load that the clavicle sees. So we felt that that was probably clinically uh, meaningful. The second takeaway is essentially if you lumped all of the dual uh, mini fragment plate constructs together, they were essentially biomechanically superior in all of our testing conditions compared with a superior plate. And they were essentially equivocal compared to an anterior plate. So we really did feel that in this study, uh, dual mini fragment plate constructs were biomechanically equivalent and occasionally superior to our traditional plating constructs. Awesome. And so we see a lot of these biomechanical studies in orthopedics because the field just lends itself to it. When, with regards to your study, what would you want a surgeon who reading it to take away to their clinical practice? Yeah, so fantastic question. I think that this really provides some pretty robust evidence in a very systematic way to support the fact that biomechanically dual plating with mini fragment constructs is biomechanically um, okay. And so the next question is, what about clinically? So there's criticism about physiologically, are we stripping the clavicle more in order to place these constructs? So that's actually something that we're looking at clinically um, in a prospective fashion as well. But anecdotally, certainly have not seen concerns with delayed unions. Uh, patients uh, certainly are reporting uh, early return to function with these constructs. And we're now starting to see that we're using shorter and shorter plates and things like that. So the incision is actually smaller um, and definitely our implant removal rate is lower. Nice, very good. So you'd say this dual mini fragment you think is now the way to go, or at least the evidence is kind of pointing that direction. Yeah. I think that uh, one of the things I love about the direction of orthopedic research is, you know, we started with a systematic review, we've done a biomechanical study, and now we're doing a large multi-center prospective cohort study to look at functional outcomes and fracture healing to sort of really provide that robust evidence to support what we're seeing anecdotally. Wow, that's great. It's really, uh, yeah, building a strong foundation to really uh, affect practice. Congratulations, that's exciting. Thank you.
<laughs> uh, any other comments or things you'd want to say about clavicle fractures? I know you'll have a chance in discussion uh, in a few days here, but. That sounds great. I think that one of the things that I really learned with this technique is if you can use meticulous soft tissue dissection. So I really placed the incision actually quite anteriorly. Um, so you get very nice soft tissue envelope. Um, you're preserving as much periosteum as possible and really individualizing your care. So if the primary you know, fracture dis deformity is very superior, maybe you actually do need a 2.7 millimeter plate to uh, really address that deforming force. And biomechanically, that's perfectly reasonable as well. If you have a really slender patient, you really may wanna try to have that 2.4 millimeter plate uh, superiorly to help avoid the uh, complications of repeat surgery for implant prominence. Great, and then just quickly, uh, post-operative, uh, protocol for the patients that you do a mini frag plate. Yeah, you bet. So we actually allow them full range of motion and full weight bearing immediately. And that's part of our prospective study is to actually evaluate that. Um, we're even developing a clinical test called the push-up test uh, because the patients have informed this. They were coming in um, two weeks and saying, hey, this this feels great and actually doing push-ups on the floor <laughs> unsolicited. So we're trying to quantify what that means for patients as well. <laughs> so. That's great. Well, uh, thank you so much for your the time and the paper. Really good stuff. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss it. I really appreciate it. Of course. Have a good one. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm here with Jamie Nicholson, and he is a complex trauma fellow at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. We're going to be talking about his his paper, Plate Fixation of Mid-Shaft Clavicle Fractures for Delayed Union and Non-Union is a cost-effective intervention, but functional deficits persist at long-term follow-up. It's a mouthful. Um, so let's just start with kind of basic background for as far as deciding to do this study and, and the genesis of it. What did you and your co-authors come up with and, and where did this come from? Great, and thanks again for the invitation to this uh, journal club. So uh, I did my residency training in Edinburgh and worked closely with Mike Robinson. And we've had a long interest in clavicle fractures really over the last two decades at Edinburgh uh, with a uh, influential trial by Mike Robinson, which was in the American JBGS in 2013. And certainly a lot of our work has came um, from uh, his supervision. Um, I think a lot of the literature now suggests that non-union um, is the main factor for poor outcome following clavicle fractures. And I guess the study for this idea was um, trying to factor in how much that non-union uh, has a long-term um, poor function for patients. We don't really know that very well from the trial data, whether that once you recover from your non-union, you get back to normal. So, and a lot of the literature for that is from quite historical cohorts now. And the second idea was we published a paper in the um, British uh, BJJ in 2019 looking at acute plate fixation versus non-operative management and showed that it's very poorly cost effective to fix all these fractures. But we had a, an idea that it was likely that if you targeted the non-unions, then it would actually be a very cost effective uh, intervention for um, a particular public health system. And that was the idea for, for that aspect of the paper. I imagine that's a focus that might be a little different from the United States versus across the pond. And cost effective analysis has become very popular in the UK now. A lot of the large trials do this secondary analysis um, for the cost effective intervention. So, I mean, essentially what it is, is you're looking at um, an intervention which has a cost and you're looking at the benefit to a patient. So either looking at the difference between a pre-existing state to the post-operative benefit. So the classic would be from the hip arthritis, pre-existing morbidity versus the long-term projected um, health benefit. Uh, or you can look at it for two treatments, one presumably being more expensive than the other, but potentially having a greater health benefit. And that's often what's used is this incremental cost effective ratio where essentially you need to come up with a calculation of a cost of invention uh, and that is looked at in the context of the benefit to the patient and that's usually called the health index so that's classically something like the eq5d or an sf12 derivative where you have a um a health well-being state it's a little bit crude obviously but measured from zero to one and that can either be at one year or can be a projected um, cost. So that can be very helpful for looking at 
um, comparing treatments or comparing one health state to another. So to put that in context, something like a hip replacement has a projected cost per quality of, a, of just over a thousand pounds. So an extremely effective cost intervention if we use around 20,000 pounds as a cutoff. Um, the context of the acute plate fixation versus non-operative management was, was close to 500,000 pounds. So something that has a very small patient benefit for the cost of the intervention versus the projected benefit to their life, if, if that makes sense. So interestingly for this paper, as you'd expect non-union, it, it, some of the most, um, uh, the, the biggest factor of poor outcomes following a lot of trauma, particularly for the upper limb. And uh, these patients at four years had a very effective cost uh, per, per quality of around 5,000 pounds. So you'd expect that would get more and more beneficial as they continue to benefit from that treatment. So a very cost effective intervention, as you'd imagine, to intervene with symptomatic non-unions. So you can't fix everyone acutely. Um, how Can you talk a little bit about your patient selection, both in terms of acute clavicle fractures and then also non-union? Because I think that's when things get really interesting who warrants a non-union surgery because there's certain patient factors that are modifiable and and things that uh, I, I don't think we always know when to pull the trigger on that. Absolutely. So certainly I think we've come to appreciate that not all patients need fixed and, and a lot of it is now I think a very patient derived decision to have their clavicle fixed a bit like a non-displaced scaphoid or a humeral shaft fracture and i think that's now well explained from the evidence i think in terms of um patient factors alone it's difficult we know age we know smoking we know females are slightly greater risk but that's a very small proportion we know the x-ray itself is very subjective depending on when it's taking supine versus erect is evidence on that some x-rays look entirely different at one week after the initial ed x-ray and I think of it like ACG injuries, it's 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 important to look at the clinical deformity and, and chat over the risk of malunion of patients. I think we don't pl place much emphasis on shortening now. And I think there's good evidence to suggest that doesn't correlate well. There's a great paper by Gowdy and Robinson in the JBGS looking at 3D proportionate shortening, showing it doesn't correlate very closely. I think there's a few indications where we might lean more towards acute fixation, obviously in polytraumas, if you're confident enough to let the weight bear on the clavicle. Um, your um, floating glenoid type fractures where you might simplify the glenoid or scapular component by fixing the clavicle um, and, and open injuries, but they make up a very small portion. So certainly for us, where I did both my residency training at Edinburgh, we see these patients and counsel them and try and work out an estimated non-union risk for them, but that's pretty hard to do based on the injury predictors alone, so smoking, combination, displacement. Um, but we advise most patients now to trial non-operative management. And if they're not getting better in the first three to six weeks, then they can always opt to have it fixed uh, if they fail that. And that's um, basically derived largely from um, a paper of ours in 2020, looking at the six week predictors. And if you have a high DASH score, if you have fracture mobility, and if you don't have any callus at the six week mark, then that is around a 60% risk of non-union. If you have none of those three factors, your, your likelihood of non-union is only about 3%. So it's a very good objective predictor that we can use. And you can probably push that even further to around the four-week mark. There was some work done in core, uh, which looked at if your uh, vast pain score doesn't improve between um, zero to four weeks, then again, that correlates well with non-union. So we would have that discussion with patients where we see them in the fracture clinic, uh, and then we would give them early uh, patient-led appointments. If patients are very um keen and they've done their reading and they've adamant they want their clavicle fix then we certainly accommodate for that we, we uh, acute operative intervention rate certainly in edinburgh it's very low it's, we, we fix primarily less than five percent of all the uh, isolated closed commutative displaced fractures that we see yeah let's say they're two three years out that yeah those patients have kind of lived there for a while you know how do you counsel that patient i think that's right isn't it and i think ideally that's what we probably should be avoiding and of practice done in the past where all these fractures were ignored and then patients come back with their very established um slotic non-unions which we know are a very difficult operation and a very different beast compared to an acute or even a slightly delayed fracture um we did a little bit of work in the, in the bjj showing that the longer you leave a clavicle for the more likely the risk of complications such as deep infection fixation failure and, and 
it's a bit of an arbitrary cutoff, but we modeled that around the three month mark, it becomes a slightly more risky operation. So that, I think that's a helpful thing to counsel patients. And I think this paper is helpful that if you have an established non-union, then you probably don't get back as well, even if you have it fixed, which is which is quite interesting. And I was quite surprised about it. I thought all these patients would be pretty much back to normal once their non-union is addressed. Um, and I think we know that a small proportion of non-unions are well tolerated. So patients who are low demand or maybe only have mild symptoms from their non-union, it, it is reasonable to manage them non-operatively because it's a slightly more complex operation. So I, I think they're the sort of things I'd be highlighting to patients early on. And then if they come back with an established non-union, um, and, and then there's obviously a whole debate about how do you address those? Should you dual plate them? Should you graft them? Should, how much of the non-union should you resect? And, and it's not really that much clear evidence on a lot of those either. Yeah, the um, the paper mentioned that a, a few of the patients underwent iliac crest bone grafting. Is that cancellous grafting? Are you talking about like a tricortical segmental defect? Yeah, it's a, again, a good question. So generally, we're not big bone grafters um, for non-unions in the clavicle in Edinburgh. And again, that's largely derived from Mike Robinson. We, we would tend to usually shorten if there is a little bit of a defect. Uh, obviously, that's proportionate and, and as we looked in context, but most of the non-unions, they tend to simplify to a simple fracture plane. So you can normally um, shorten a little bit um, in order to try and get a bit of overlap. Particularly, it's quite useful, we find, to, to try and shorten it to the, uh, kind of an oblique fracture that you can try and lag for a bit of um, stability. So most of the grafting occasionally was undertaken was for very sclerotic ones, just to take some cancellous bone grafting. But I have to be with that, that's become less um, popular with time and we wouldn't routinely graft our non-unions. So the persistent functional deficits, you said that was one of the things that surprised you about the paper. What do you think that's coming from? Yeah, so it's interesting because eh? it's it's like a long bone, it's a strut to the to the shoulder. And there's that classic paper by Potter and McKee, I think all the way back in 2007, which suggested that non-union um, interventions do well and they get pretty good dash scores, but they get a little bit of um, functional impairment. And I think they looked at um, endurance and they showed that they had a little bit of endurance and um, uh, strength impairment. I, I'm not sure for, for our cohort, and, and I guess that was slightly annoying, we maybe should have done a bit of a qualitative look at these patients and why they were unsatisfied, because it was around one in five were still unsatisfied. It, it might be that there's still some recovery of, of, of muscle atrophy of, of do you mean we see um, adhesive capsulitis sometimes in the shoulder and you get maybe a stiff shoulder joint. Um, I, I, I suspect a lot of it is maybe just dissatisfaction no, with treatment. I think if you've been through that non-union process, you've lived with it, you've then had to have further surgery, potentially you've then had to have the plate removed or, or problems with infection, et cetera, then I suspect people are just a little bit dissatisfied with their treatment. And I do wonder if there's a little bit of element of once you've had a bit of chronic pain and a, and a slightly poor outcome of something, it, then maybe you're always going to be a bit dissatisfied. It's interesting because our uh, group at Edinburgh, um, uh, Andrew Duckworth and Will Oliver have just published on long-term outcomes of the humerus. And it's quite similar to the humeral shaft as well. If you have an established humeral shaft on union and you have that fixed, then there's still a little bit of functional impairment with that. And it's a similar idea. I'm not sure why that is with a long bone fracture, but I, I wonder if it is an element of uh, just that dissatisfaction and chronic pain um, modeling that you have. And it's hard to get rid of that perhaps. I'm not sure. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts of the panel's discussion on the night about it. So anything else you want to you want to add or anything else you would underscore about the paper? Um, I, well, th thanks again for the uh, invitation. It was it was, a, I guess, a small idea for a paper that a very enthusiastic, enthusiastic junior doctor did with me. And I, I hope it adds to some of the literature we produced for Edinburgh. And uh, and if people are interested in it, I'd encourage you to look hopefully at some of the other papers which have been, I hope, helpful to try and inform that debate and particularly the consent process with patients about the options out there. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks again. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, maybe we'll get the uh, panelists and the moderators uh, to just throw their videos on and we'll uh, we'll start the Q&A. Again, if you have some questions, please throw them in the, the Q&A section so we can get them answered. Um, I think I'm going to start with one that that came in through the Q&A because I think it, it kind of goes through the theme of all, all the papers, which is what is everyone's current 
immobilization or we'll call it non-operative treatment because I'm not sure everyone immobilizes, but I'd love to hear how you how you take care of that patient when they walk in the door and they're decided to go non-operative. Yeah, I'll start. Maybe, um, yeah, you want to start with, yeah, adolescent yeah, experience. That'd be great. Um, well, it, it might have been a question regarding the study. In the study, um, it was not a standardized treatment protocol. So there were actually 68 different providers um, who were the principal providers for those um, those patients. And so uh, every we were allowing for variation. So as a sort of relative scientific weakness of the study, it wasn't a standardized approach for the non-op, uh, but it has the strength of being sort of generalizable in that way, it accounts for the variation that exists in practice. Um, however, most of us uh, follow sort of the simple rule of uh, sling tends to be favored over sling and swath or a figure eight, though there were a couple instances of those uh, types of immobilization uh, initially. And then at two weeks, what I've done and, and most of our kind of team has done is uh, allowing for removal of the sling at the two week visit uh, when at home uh, and when resting, uh, but to continue use of that uh, until about the six week visit while at school and when up and about with the adolescent population I treat, reminding themselves and their friends and teammates and so on that they're still carrying precious cargo, avoids that uh, refracture risk and the uh, proclivity to jump back into the mix too early. So. Yeah, sure. I can maybe speak to sort of general principles for the adult population. So very similar. Um, we would really try to encourage hand, wrist, and elbow motion kind of right away uh, to avoid stiffness and other associated, you know, joints. Um, and then similarly, coming out of the cuff and collar or sling around the two-week mark to start pendulums and wall walk sort of um, active assisted range of motion. Um, for us, return to sport is really important. So skiing and hockey and things like that. So we definitely like to refrain from you know, strengthening um, till about six weeks and then return to sport with full motion and full strength. That's great. Oh, wait, perfect. Perfect timing. Another question. So biomechanically, dual plating is superior, but how does this translate clinically? So they're asking maybe because we obviously don't have the answer to this quite the next question, but maybe anecdotally, what have you seen in terms of uh, hardware removal rates between the two groups? Yeah, I do think it's a fantastic question because biomechanical studies are fantastic for, you know, measuring things like stiffness or load to failure. And so what we're seeing with biomechanical superiority is, is there stiffer implants? And so then, of course, the concern becomes, well, what if they're too stiff and we're actually causing a delay in time to union? And so as we've alluded to here, we're now you know studying this uh, prospectively. I'm looking at a number of patient reported outcome measures, functional outcomes, um, radio graphic union, which I will admit is extremely difficult when you have a dual plate construct. So full, full disclosure, that is a big challenge, but I think it's really the patient reported functional uh, uh, outcomes that are going, going to be really important for really gauging that time to union. Uh, but it is an excellent question. So what we can say is the implants are as stiff or stiffer uh, compared to our traditional pre-contoured, pre-manufactured 3.5 millimeter plate and screw constructs. And then follow-up question on that. So if that's biomechanical data, are you letting them do more now that you treat them that way? Like activity, yeah. weight-bearing, return to sport compared to how you used to treat them? Yeah, so I think this is a fantastic question because this is very patient informed. I have to tell you, it's really difficult to hold these patients back. Um, so as I mentioned, sort of things like this push-up test or return to work and sport were quantifying prospectively because these patients are really challenging these constructs. And again, very anecdotally, we're not seeing, you know, increase in non-union peri-implant fractures, um, anything that's terribly concerning. Um, so I like that this is a very patient form direction to really push um, the envelope. And we are, you know, operatively allowing these patients to, you know, range right away post-op day one and to weight bear as tolerated, um, even in the setting of if they have, say, a lower extremity injury where they have to, you know, be protective weight bearing for that injury. Um, so I think that some of this prospect prospective work, excuse me, in this area will be really helpful for all of us. <laughs> Yeah, I might just add, you know, in the adolescence, uh, I sort of 
told half the story because from six weeks on, there's there's a key portion which is uh, like adults with their plates, the adolescents also want to test their non-operative construct, their biologic mm -hmm. construct. So at six weeks, I usually have them do push-ups, and they can usually do a few with pain-free uh, activity. So I will let people return the non-contact sports lifting training for their sport at six weeks and then return to contact sports at three months. And that's been pretty reliable as well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the questions was just about that. With, with, with uh, post-opera protocol, do you change with the two-plate technique? And I, I would agree with you. I mean, I, I definitely feel better about it having a second plate on there and, and especially in the polytrauma patient, that's where I've, that's where my practice changed first was, was to go to a dual plate for those patients that need crutches to get out of bed. Hopefully, hopefully these new studies coming out will show that it actually makes a difference clinically. Um, I think one of the questions was about intramedullary stabilization and do you see a role for that or, or where does that fit in your practice paradigm? Uh, perhaps I can go first. Uh, you know, I have to say a fairly limited role. It's not something that we're seeing very commonly. And I think with the idea of orthogonal plating and, and now sort of some support with both biomechanically and ongoing uh, clinical data to support the, I don't want to necessarily say super, superiority yet. I don't know if that's entirely fair, but um, the uh, potential advantages to that, uh, it does I think maybe make us relook at uh, some of the benefits that we thought were there with intermodellary fixation, such as earlier weight bearing. Um, so I think we're able to achieve this with a pretty reliable dual plating construct. And so I've definitely seen that go out of favor, uh, certainly in North America, in my experience. Yeah, I would say for adolescents as well, it's a group that's sort of particularly poorly suited for the IM males in that um, you know, the ones that aren't, don't have the locking mechanisms. We worry about migration, of course. And so the modern locking mechanisms, a few different manufacturers and such, but should they have a refracture with some of those locking mechanisms? I've heard stories of some catastrophic scenarios of the locking mechanism sort of being stuck in the bone and difficult removal and revision and things like that. So it's usually the adolescents that have a risk of refracture that are the ones come in in the first place. Um, and so uh, we have tended to stay away from those, uh, the, though they can work if you're willing to remove them early and, and sort of ensure that secondary surgery, which um, is maybe too much for many people. Yeah, I think one of the other concerns that comes up with, with intramedullary fixation is, you know, obviously at the SC joint, you have some rotational play, and then at the AC joint, you've got rotational play. How do you control that with an implant that isn't designed to necessarily do that? So um, interesting, interesting thoughts there. Um, question came in about in the non-op versus op categories or studies, was there a difference in return to sport slash activity? I know we can, we sort of touched on that with respect to the adolescent uh patient population, but did, did you look at that or are you planning to look at that in, in more detail? Yeah, we have looked at that. Um, we've uh, done a better job in our sort of facts B cohort. So some studies um, do out that uh, have better data on that. But in general, what we found was there is a difference, but the difference is sort of one to, to two and a half weeks or so. And so um, of course, that's somewhat surgeon driven or caregiver driven in terms of when you let people go back. Uh, I spent a lot of time this past week with the, the son of a pro former pro football player just trying to explain that we don't have the study that tests 100 adolescents at 12 weeks and 15 weeks and six weeks to know what the refracture rate is for football at those different times. But um, uh, I think that if there's a real difference in somebody's future uh, to return to sport between that six and 12 weeks, scholarship type opportunities, it's it's not unreasonable to think about it um, as an indication for surgery. Uh, but we've been very reliably getting people back between two and a half and three months with non-operative treatment. And therefore, it really has to be, you know, a tight margin, you know, to want to get those extra two weeks in um, with a chance of removal down the line. So. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I see uh, Jamie, you're joining us. So thank, thanks. It looks like you're in the OR. So to uh, 
to to just get you up to speed. We're just taking some questions from the the group, and I think I'll, I'll direct one at you if that's all right, because I think it's a, a nice one that ties into your paper. But uh, it, someone asked, is there a difference measuring the length if you look at uh, comparison of clavicle length? So shortening is what they're getting at. Uh, if we look at using the midline versus medial scapula as an indication for how much shortening and whether that would make you change your treatment algorithm. Absolutely. And just uh, apologies. I, the first case I thought would be done in, in time. So apologies. I'm a bit late joining the party. I'm really excited to uh, be here. And thanks again for the invitation. I think the shortening debate is an interesting one, isn't it? And that that was one of the original drivers in that Hill paper back in 97 about dissatisfaction along with non-union. We know that projection of X-rays will will massively um, alter what we perceive as shortening. Uh, we can do it clinically, and that's that's a reliable way in some respects of doing it, along from the stenic thicker knots to the ACG. But I think a chest X-ray is a kind of similar idea to that. I think, but I think the most representative one is is Mike Robinson and Ewan Gowdy's paper on three D modeling, and I think it's a key aspect that two centimeters of shortening for a 100 kilogram rugby player versus a 50 kilogram um, netball player is not entirely different. So whether an absolute shortening has any real difference, probably it has some effect, but whether that is independent of dissatisfaction, probably minor, I suspect, in the majority of patients cope with it. And really trying to do that clinically without proper um, CT comparison against the contralateral clavicle I, I suspect a little bit inaccurate. So uh, personally, uh, in Edinburgh, we're very conservative with these, and we don't place a big emphasis on malunion. We we place most of the emphasis on on non-union risk prediction. Um, I think the um, obviously some fractures look worse than others, and rather than the shortening, you obviously get some gross deformity with the button holding through the fascia, and and that's probably a cosmetic and a reasonable thing to highlight to some patients that to some extent that will progress rather than absolute shortening driving management. That's helpful. Um, ben or Prism, any any thoughts related to that? Yes, so we really haven't found much of a correlation between shortening and outcome in the adolescent age group. Um, we do have one study that um, basically uh, shows that we have agreement on the two different types of measurement for shortening and um, with some sort of follow-up work on how uh, are the most modern shortening measurements are done incorrectly. They take the end of the bone to the end of the bone, but most of these are oblique fractures. And so the proper or truer way to measure shortening would be you know, the tip of the bone to the corresponding lucency of the other fragment. Um, and so there's, we showed that there's a difference between those and that when you measure true shortening, we call it uh, cortex to corresponding cortex shortening. It's generally much lower and rarely under that two centimeter threshold or, or, or rarely over that two centimeter threshold compared to uh, sort of just end-to-end -end shortening, which is the sort of common simplistic way to, to, that we see it done in clinics by others. And follow-up question for the children, like let's say a 12-year-old boy, are you looking at absolute measurements or percentages of shortening compared, you know, let's say they're still quite small or? Great point, because because one centimeter, as um, was uh, Jamie stated, one centimeter in a, in a 12-year-old may be very different from uh, one centimeter in a um, in an 18 year old. So, uh, if, if we thought shortening made a big difference, we might calculate those percentages and, and fret over this a little bit, but, uh, because we haven't uh, seen it be too impactful on, on clinical status, uh, in any way, uh, we have not yet. Perhaps the only thing, other thing I would add, this is a fantastic discussion, um, is that uh, the sort of value of, again, different projections and things. And so an upright x-ray looks very different from that, you know, initial supine x-ray in the trauma bay. And so I think particularly in some of the decision making around multiply injured patients, especially if you're trying to decide about the impact it could have on early functional recovery and uh, weight bearing and things like that, uh, certainly looking at uh, an upright film at the very least can help us to quantify that displacement a little bit better.
Jimmy, you were going to comment? Uh, yeah, I was just going to follow up, and I was really pleased to see the adolescent paper um, feature for the Journal Club, because I think that's a great message. And um, we published a sort of retrospective series with a very similar um, a message with that non-union is exceptionally rare and, and function-wise these adolescents seem to do okay. I was interested in the panel's thoughts on, on the potential for remodeling, particularly in these younger teenagers, because particularly those, the, the, the angulated fractures, the sort of Robinson 2B2, they, they, they invariably heal and they have a bit of an angular deformity, but the, the clavicle is still growing up until what, 25 or so. And uh, I'd be interested to hear what you guys, in terms of recommendation you gave, do you think might not ever completely remodel, but we've been managing for, for many millennia, non-operative adolescent factors without too much uh, sequelae, I think. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. We we really appreciated uh, your paper on uh, on adolescence, uh, the one from your center. I think it corroborated a lot of our findings nicely. We we've looked uh, deeply into uh, remodeling, uh, both early remodeling, which we kind of referred to as settling, because we found in the first sort of six to ten weeks there was a tremendous change in the measurements of shortening, superior displacement, and angulation that an adolescent can un undergo. And then longer term, um, we found a subset of those that we had uh, uh, treated or found with fractures, then got x-rays for any number of reasons years down the line. Um, so we found the remodeling uh, potential was was tremendous with the majority undergoing near complete remodeling um, to match the the parameters of the of the other clavicle. So if this is the first bone in the body to begin ossification, it's also the last to finish ossification. We found, I think, in studies average age 25. And so even into early 20s, we found adolescents have that remodeling capacity. So yeah, that's great. I think, uh, you know, Oh, yeah, fire away. No, fire away. Oh, sorry. I had a question in a different vein, but uh, just talking about non unions in general in the clavicles. You know, we have literature about being able to assess them in the humerus. We have literature in the tibia that it may take six to nine months. How is the panel assessing if you're going down on the operative treatment pathway to call, hey, this is a non union or this needs surgery? Now it's not going to heal. I think J Jamie in his, in his paper addressed that really nicely, which is like, I think they're sort of catching the impending non-unions as much as the established non-unions. We use three months as a delayed union, six months as a, as a non-union. And we certainly have, you know, over time seen some people kind of request, you know, surgical treatment, uh, either two months with very little callus or four months with some callus, but but not quite functionally there, but it's exceedingly rare in our age group. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Jamie can address that well. Yeah, no, th th thank you again for that. Um, I mean, certainly we've had a bit of a paradigm shift from being extremely conservative with them to try and picking out the the bad apples and two for the humeral shaft, two for the clavicle. I think you, you you know that you see a big difference in patients around that three to six week mark if they initially trialed on operative management. And it's a surprise if you don't um, pick these guys out early and they shouldn't be a surprise if they get to six months with a non-union. I suspect they were miserable at the four to six week mark. And I guess the big downside of that is, is obviously you lose some of that early rehabilitation benefit of ORF. Um, and it's a slightly more challenging operation, but do you have an acute plate fixations are, are pretty straightforward and uh, an established non-union is an entirely different beast to fixing one at the four to six week mark from, from our experience. And I think patients buy into that because they feel if they want to go for non-optimal management, they've given it a try and you're not hanging on for that three to six months of disability with the true established non-union. Uh, and I thought um, this, this paper that one of our medical students did, um, which was discussed in the Journal Club tonight, um, highlights potentially some of that need to not allow people to fester with a non-union where they establish you know, a degree of chronic pain, probably a degree of dissatisfaction with their treatment, and potentially picking them up sooner is a reasonable compromise and, and saves a lot of over intervention in a lot of these fractures, which would uneventfully heal. Yeah, 
I think what you're hearing, and it's so wonderful to hear this conversation, it's both sort of that index uh, decision-making and then sort of this slow to heal decision-making that it's, we're really sharing that decision with patients based on their functional needs and, and things. And that's really starting to inform a lot of orthopedic care. Um, so it's nice to, nice to see that. I completely agree, Jamie, that it's a lot more straightforward when you've given things a try. You're not seeing that rapid functional recovery. You have a patient that has that necessity, whether it's for work or school or sport. Um, and that's a really nice shared decision-making to, to move forward with things instead of, you know, having them, you know, languish for quite some time. And then now your paper is really supportive of the fact that as we've seen in other bones, we just don't get them back to even their baseline. So, so that's great. Um, maybe a nod also to Ben. It's nice to see that you guys are doing some of the short-term follow-up as well, because as you know, in the adult population, that's where we see the early benefit. Um, and so it's really that patient selection for the overhead labor or somebody that's providing for their family that, you know, maybe that even three, six week, even to three months, that early functional gain is, is really important to that particular patient and it warrants taking on the associated risks of an operation. It on the topic is, of patient, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say it's, it certainly is true for the, for the young athlete and their parents. Yep. <laughs> on the topic of patient selection, I'm curious to know what the panel does. The same patients that maybe have issues with healing they're smoking a pack or two a day. Maybe they're not that compliant. Maybe their diabetes isn't controlled. So that's a patient that might not heal, but also not a great surgical patient. How are you counseling that patient? I can start if that's okay. I I, I have to be. I I see these all like a like a during a calcaneal fracture or proximal humerus fracture. There's no obligation that you have to do an operation. I, I think it's worthwhile counseling that there's still an intrinsic risk of non-union. And some of the papers out there are still quoting the risk of non-union with non-operative management in terms of the, the risk up there at 10 to 20% with, with smokers um, with a non-union in terms of um, uh, plating them doesn't necessarily always fix the fracture. We know that there's risks potentially with infection things. So uh, I, it's a hard thing to refuse the surgery if they're very keen and they are struggling with a non-union. I think they need to be obviously cancelled and it might be helpful to get a second surgeon's opinion to, to reinforce that. Um, uh, we, we do fix smokers with non-unions um, and um, I think it's a reasonable thing to do but certainly anecdotally and I think there is evidence to back up that they do have higher complications and intrinsic risk of non-union afterwards. I think we've been highlighting is, is sort of trying really hard to identify that patient that's at high risk of going on to non-union a little bit earlier. Um, and so again, maybe a bit of a plug for the possible uh, advantages with um, orthogonal plating. So you have additional fixation. A lot of the implants will actually have locking screw options. Again, we did not test that in our biomechanical uh, paper, but something that you can also consider in those higher risk uh, patients. But I agree with what Jamie said. I think it's really informed decision-making because you take on a risk sort of either way with either treatment option. And so you have to be very actively involved in, in whether it's operative or non-operative uh, selection of treatment and follow them along to ensure the best possible outcome. <laughs> and while I think these you know, studies have shown that the non-union patients may, may be amongst those that, that do the worst, uh, there's also a place for you know, the asymptomatic non-union. So not every non-union is going to be severely symptomatic. And as the pendulum has swung a little bit back towards non-operative treatment in adolescence, at least at our institution, since some of our studies, uh, we have seen that less than 1%, so a couple instances of non-unions, but uh, remarkably, I think two of the three have been completely asymptomatic, including going on to sort of uh, collegiate um, sports recruiting seasons that were successful and, and so on, wrestling, soccer. Um, so um, some of the fibrous non-union uh, capacity of the of the young healing uh, shoulder in an adolescent may translate to reasonable results uh, despite the lack of pure bony bridges. I think we've gone uh, you know back and forth a little bit on on who maybe to to talk out of an operation or at least have a conversation with one of the questions is sort of who who's that patient who you would really push or offer the operation to? Is there a, 
patient population, a fracture characteristic, uh, an injury pattern, or a need to get back to sport, who you would, you know, probably push or even recommend an operation for? And jump on in to start this one off. Um, so again, I, I really like this phrase that's coming out a lot more in shared decision making. So I think really understanding the patient's occupation, their functional demands. Um, we're in a very active city, as are many of us. And so what are their recreational activities that really give them their livelihood? And so sort of understanding what it is that they would like to return to and, and some of the necessity involved in that too. Are they providing for their family, for example? Um, are they a student that's a computer science programmer? You know, those are very different patients that can still be 25 years old, you know. Um, so really understanding their functional uh, demands. Um, and then I do think imaging initially is important. So an upright x-ray or at least um, that sort of index uh, initial x-ray, and then you can see them a week or two later. So looking at some signs of instability or not, um, and then counseling the patient as far as what the two treatment arms would look like, uh, making that decision together. So a displaced clavicle and a highly active patient that's maybe an overhead laborer, a mountain climber, someone who's really, we've got lots of mountain bikers that are weight bearing on their upper extremity and that's their passion. So those are patients that we would recommend uh, proceeding with surgical fixation um, because of that early functional gain. And we're very open to discuss with them that, you know, at a year or two, um, you're likely going to be fairly similar to having left this to heal on its own. For the population I treat, I would say the severely angulated uh, fracture in a contact athlete might be one to consider, as those can sometimes be pretty slow to heal in that apex superior portion, and the bending force of a shoulder to blow, a shoulder blow, or a shoulder to ground kind of blow um, is is a risk of refracture, and then and then a refracture that occurs in a contact athlete, I think, is one I might consider as those might be slower or harder to heal. Um, and um, those patients are sort of, to, to send them through a possible second refracture um, when going back to contact sports. Not to say that one can't refracture with a plate in place. Those are also, we've shown trickier uh, when they arise. They're usually peri-implant fractures, more common to need another surgery, but, um, but that, those are sort of the two subsets. The primary completely displaced fracture, regardless of comminution, regardless of shortening, regardless of superior displacement, pretty rarely in my in my, my hands gets recommended a surgery. Yeah, I would, I would mirror the, the panelist discussion there. I, I, sort of anecdotal examples, maybe ones where there's a clear big fascial breach. I think they they probably don't remodel as well, and sometimes we do see those. Patients come back unhappy and a malunion surgery is miserable. But I mean, having said that, just doing an osseous prominence removal is pretty straightforward to do. And that does seem to settle those patients down. Um, I, I don't know if that in itself is a very strong predictor for non-union. That's not something I've necessarily seen in the literature. It's maybe a bit subjective. That doesn't always get commented on. Uh, and then I guess maybe the, I mean, the polytrauma patients, as long as you're confident enough to let them fully weight bear on the limb and that's maybe where things like the dual plating, I, I certainly we have a lot lower threshold for doing that now for a lot of fractures for the, for the humerus, for the clavicle, for the distal femur. And I, I don't think you um, are disrupting much of the biological footprint to put a secondary small plate on. And, and as uh, your, your papers highlighted for the biomechanical stability of that, it, it seems to make good sense if it's a non-union or if it's a revision or if it's potentially a complex fracture of the polytrauma just to allow you to fully weight bear on that limb if they've got lower limb injuries that seems sensible to me um great i want to make sure we get um the q a's uh, through from the uh the attendees as well so there's uh one a real quick one hopefully uh is z deformity an indication for surgery yes or no not for adolescents uh, from the study that um, we presented at the OTA last year and that uh, has uh, been submitted for publication. Yes, certainly those long and heal, don't they? That it's always the funny thing about the non-unions. I think it's often very benign looking fractures, uh, which which can surprise you. Um, and, and that's, I think, where some of the early functional recovery is helpful. 
um, rather than the fracture itself. But yeah, there was certainly we would I wouldn't rush in for Z deformity in itself. Agreed. And maybe just re-highlighting Jamie's point about fascial um, puncturing, things like that. So I think it's less the deformity and it's more sort of the almost instability characteristics of the, the clavicle over time if, if you have that opportunity. Perfect. And then maybe our last last question. There's a bunch about sort of the logistics of of dual plating. So one one, I'm gonna put them all into one question if I can. So one is sort of plate length longer up top or longer anteriorly. And then a related but slightly different question, which is choice of screws, cancellus versus cortical. Um, you know, do you use one over the other based on where you are, whether you're mid shaft or lateral? Um Maybe maybe we'll throw in locking screws because that's another one that comes up uh, often. So I know sort of nebulous, but maybe the technique of your dual plating and what, what people are using. Yeah, sure. So maybe I'll take that as far as I think one of the things that was reassuring with um, having these four different uh, groups and different constructs was that given that they were all very, very similar in biomechanical um you know, outcomes, I think that we can actually start using a little bit more of a precision medicine approach and looking at the main deforming forces and using plates appropriately that way. And so ideally, if whenever possible, a two seven plate anteriorly gives you larger screws that are longer in the A to P direction, as opposed to the superior plating. So ideally, um, especially let's say a polytrauma patient, a larger patient, um, some extra stresses across that, that bone. I think that's a really great um, opportunity. And then the counter to that is, as I mentioned in the, the interview, if the main deforming force is really the superior um, displacement and you really need to control sort of the apex of that deformity, then perhaps the 2-7 plate uh, superiorly is, is warranted in that particular fracture pattern. So a little bit fracture pattern specific. I think we have uh, some data to support that that's reasonable. Um, type of screw. Um, we did not test anything other than cortical screws, so that's important to note. Um, I have not used cancellous screws in the clavicle perhaps ever, so I can't really comment on that specifically. Um, I do think the locking option has two potential benefits. And one is if you do have that uh, patient with poor bone quality, you're concerned about uh, patient-associated risk factors for um, implant failure, for example, it is a good option. The other thing that's nice is it actually recesses into the plate. So if you have a really slender patient, Patient. And that two, four locking screws on the superior part is about as low profile as I think we have available to us. So something to consider in that uh, situation. Um, but we did not test, to be very clear, we didn't test locking screws in our biomechanical uh, study perhaps a future direction. Um, and then length, um, we have uh, shorter plates and longer plates, and we kept the overall length similar in our study to the pre-contoured plates that are available. Um, as I mentioned, we're getting shorter and shorter. Um, so we'll see what our prospective uh, clinical data supports. <laughs> Not much of a role for locking screws in the you know young adolescent bone, uh, but uh, I think the president's answer covered pretty much all the other thoughtful considerations. I'd be interested okay. to hear just if, if I may, Jason, just briefly, is is dual plating becoming the norm now in your institution or in, in terms of um acute fixation and non-unions? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I'll comment on my institution and what I'm sort of seeing more regionally. So certainly in our institution, I would say that's arguably standard of care. Uh, when we actually set out to design the study, we tried very hard to look at a randomized design, and we simply didn't have clinical equipoise in my center. And so we've gone with the prospective cohort uh, design. However, that being said, there are certainly lots of centers that are still using um, you know larger uh, pre-contoured traditional plates. And so hopefully we can actually prospectively look at um, some of the potential potential improvements in early function and uh, certainly what we believe will be um, our hypothesis proving uh, reduced implant uh, removal rates. Ironically, it's probably a trend towards cost savings just with the non-precontoured plates um, as well as potentially the less the secondary surgeries. But. Yeah, you're completely right. And I love Jamie's comments about how it's really important, I think, to be a bit more socially conscious with our implant costs. And so as soon as there's a secondary operation, it almost becomes, uh, it swings in favor of the index procedure. So you're absolutely right. All right. Well, I think we're at, we're at time. So if other people have other comments, I'm, I'm happy to keep the conversation going because I think it's a, a great topic with lots to digest. But 
Um, any last minute comments or thoughts, anyone? Great. Oh, I think we got all our questions answered. So I, th I think we're great and we're good. So I want to thank everyone. Thank our panelists. Thank our moderators. Thank you so much for coming. I think I have, uh, give me 30 seconds and I'll pull up our final little slides to remind everyone. Number one, this will be uh, available on um, online, so on YouTube. So here's the here's the details of that. Um, you will get uh, get a link in the next 24 hours to come and watch it. And then our upcoming journal clubs. So November 14th, we have one on uh, uh, pelvic ring. On December 12th, on geriatric protrochanteric fractures. Uh, and then last but not least, a little little plug for my AO. So um, please uh, consider downloading the app. Uh, there's some really awesome content on there that can uh, be really valuable for us in, in practice to one, connect with others, two, chat about cases. And then actually something I learned about, which is the case folio, which is a nice opportunity to, to keep your cases stored. So uh, again, thank you very much uh, to our panelists and, and moderators. Really appreciate the, the time you took tonight to, to review such an interesting topic.